Hello, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. This is Pam Coley, and uh, I hope you're having a great day. I just returned from Oaxaca, Mexico, where I had a super workshop with uh, 12 students, and um, this one happened to be through Bellissima Artscapes, and I'll be doing some exciting workshops with them in 2020. And one of them, Island Wood, it's on Bainbridge Island. Its mission is to provide exceptional learning experiences and to inspire lifelong environmental and community stewardship. So I hope you'll join us. So today uh, I want to uh, let you know that I was interviewed before I went to Mexico by Angie Knoll. She reached out to me and she asked if I would agree to an interview for her wonderful podcast called the Not Starving Artist. And I thought, wow, what a great name. What an interesting name and what a great idea. So this is her website. And I hope that all of you will check it out because when I did, I was just so impressed. She is a writer and artist. She's originally from South Africa. Now she lives in New Zealand. And uh, since I'm gonna be teaching there next year, uh, probably be doing about three workshops there, um, I just, thought that was really kind of a coincidence that she had reached out to me to do this um, interview. So this is her website, it's, it's angienoll.com. And um, just notice that, you know, she has this link here called podcasts. And if you click on that, because that's what she was asking me to do as a podcast, I saw this, The Not Starving Artist. And I read this, how do they do it? What inspires them? How do they fit it in? What is their recipe? And I thought, what a great idea. And I was just so excited to work with her. So before I packed my suitcase, uh, in fact, about the day before I left for Mexico, um, my head was a little scattered. I'll say that admittedly after I listened to the interview, it's like, oh, I left a few things out. But anyway, she was kind enough to interview me and I so enjoyed it. I want you to see though, some of these prior podcasts that she's done, you know, with artists and writers and bakers and you know, all kinds of creative people. And I think that's what I loved about what she's doing here. I think as an artist, you know, we're all wondering what do other artists do and how do they do it? So I have a lot of great podcasts to listen to while I'm painting. And I hope you will do the same. Remember this website, angienoll.com. So she just published my, um, my podcast. And when you click on this, you know, she entitled it, What is abstract expressionism with artist Pamela Coey. Before she interviewed me, I, I wasn't quite sure what the title would be. So I didn't really brush up on my abstract expressionism. I just know that that is the type of art that really inspires me. So by the way, here are all the topics. Um, there are quite a few topics that we talked about for about an hour. Uh, you can visit her website and, and look at all of those wonderful things. They're all included in the podcast. But I'm going to replay the podcast on my YouTube channel for a couple of reasons. I want to add a little bit of information that I feel like I left out and she was kind enough to, to share the audio with me. So if you're happy to see her podcast on my channel in my comment section, say thanks Angie for sharing this. Uh, and then also visit her website because I think you'll really enjoy her other podcasts. Okay, let's get started. Thanks everybody. to the Not Starving Artist How She Does It podcast. I'm your host, Angie Knoll, writer, illustrator, and creative entrepreneur. Every week, I bring you interviews with other creative women for an insider look into their lives to find out how they are living their art so that you too can be inspired through their stories, experience, and tools to live at your creative potential and also be a not starving artist. Remember to visit AngieKnoll.com for show notes and links to our guest. Hello creatives! Our guest today is a brilliant artist who plays with her materials in such a joyful way that it's simply inspirational to watch her. Before I introduce her, remember that you can visit angienoll.com for all the show notes and links mentioned, as well as a link to a 52-week Creative Builder program, completely free and delivered to your inbox once a week. Pamela Cowie is an abstract expressionist artist from Montana who plays with cold wax and oils, acrylics, encaustic methods and mixed media. Her work is in the permanent collection of several museums and public collections both nationally and internationally. She's featured in the book Cold Wax Medium, Techniques, Concepts and Conversations, and she's now a full-time studio artist teaching locally and internationally. Hi Pamela and thank you for being on the show. Thanks very much Angie, it's great to be here. Pamela, can you just tell the listeners um, first off, what sort of artist are you? 
Um, so I consider myself to be an abstract expressionist artist because my work is non-objective uh, versus um, the many other types of work I used to do leading up to this point. But I would say that I really focus on non-objective artwork because I feel like um, for me at this point in my life, um, it's all about uh, looking inward, uh, trying to find inspiration from within, uh, trying to be very aware of my feelings um, internally about all the things that I see that develop on my painting mm -hmm. as it happens. So I don't use any reference material. I don't use any photos or sketches or anything. It all has to be for me from within. That's, that's a very interesting process. Um, maybe you can just expand a little bit on what exactly you mean by abstract expressionist. Is that different from just an abstract artist? And maybe also expand more on um, what you mean by non-objective art. I know you've, you've said it's all from inside of you, but maybe a little bit more about your process. How do you go about this? Right. So when I say abstract expressionist, and, you know, because I think most, most people who have studied our history or if they're in the state, they're pretty, um, pretty familiar with that period of time, you know, Jackson Pollock and, um, you know, Motherwell and, and all the artists who really were not representational. They weren't trying to represent mm -hmm. one recognizable thing. It was about mark making. It was about shape. It was about color, texture. Um, those were the things that they were more interested in. And Kandinsky, you know, um, I'm, I'm greatly inspired by his work, and he's considered the father of abstract expressionism. Yes. And so, you know, when I read his book, Point to Line and Plane, it, it was really uh, just wonderful to see that art doesn't have to be about any one thing. It can be about line and shape and color and texture. And because that in itself has so much room and latitude for finding out what it is you love. And I. so when people look at non-objective work versus abstract work, the difference is that abstraction usually has some, some connection to something in reality that people can mm -hmm. hang on to. It might be an abstracted landscape. It might be an abstracted floral, or it might be an abstracted um, whatever. But people can say, oh, gosh, that's, you know, that's this. Whereas in non-objective work, it's like, what most people will say if they don't understand this type of art, they'll say, well, what is it? And my three-year-old can do it. Yes, um, yes. However, because I have done everything from basically, I've done everything from photorealism to semi-abstraction to semi-realism, um, all of these different things before I got to where I am now. The reason why I like non-objective work is because I feel like for me personally, it is the hardest thing I've ever done. It's the most challenging, the most rewarding, and it's the one place I can be in my studio um, in this genre and never, ever get bored because I have nothing to uh, start with. I have no colors. Yes. I have no nothing. Yeah. So, I mean, that is a really good um, explanation of abstract expressionism versus just abstract now that you've mentioned that you get into your studio with nothing to start with, tell us a little bit about your process. Because okay, yeah. you don't start yeah. with the reference material like most other artists would. So when yeah. do you start? <laughs> sure. Um, so, yeah, and this is actually my process. When I started to really sit down and think about it, um, I felt like the reason my process is the way it is right now, and I'm in my mid-50s, my late 50s, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> um, so... My process is a result of, I'd say, at least two decades of struggling, mm -hmm. um, being stuck, having fear, procrastinating, all those things. And what I found was that if I am going to be a professional artist, and, and, and also because I'm, a, I'm, I'm an instructor and I teach other artists, um, I, I felt like I need to be able to conquer all my fear. I need to not procrastinate. I need to figure out how to get unstuck. And because these are kind of universal places where artists do get stuck, yes. um, what I figured out, <laughs> you're saying yes, and I, I know because I keep, I keep asking artists, you know, what is the biggest thing that you find to be difficult in your art making? And it, it really does boil down to those three things. Mm -hmm. And so what I have come to realize is that there are really three stages of my art, my process, and this is what I teach in my online course, 
it's to simplify it down. Um, I, I do simplify it down to kind of three basic things that I do. The first one is play. Um, and play took me a whole year to be able to let go of expectations and perfectionism, and expectations and, you know, is God be beautiful and all these things. Uh -huh. Because if you come into your studio with that kind of an, um, a mentality, uh, nine times out of 10, you're going to be like, I have other things to do right now. I'm not going to go to my studio. It's yes. frightening. So yes. when, when I literally, it took me a year to put my mindset to be able to put my, my head and my mindset into that of a three-year-old. And that's what I tell my students. It's like, today, we're three. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself thinking or worrying or being critical or saying, oh, my gosh, it's ugly, you're thinking too much. Because yes. you need, if you're truly three, you're not thinking about anything but the joy yes. of trying a color and looking at a line. And, you know, and it, it's once you can do it, and, and it does take practice and time. And for every artist, it's a different amount of, you know, that that process takes time. For me, it took a whole year because I would go on so tightly that I had to unwind myself. When I figured out how to do it, um, I never really had any difficulty getting started again. And, and I do have a YouTube channel. This is what I try to tell other people. Like, mm -hmm. you, you, all you have to do is play. Yes. If you can just get that first stroke, that first thing onto a white canvas, which can be very intimidating, um, overwhelming, you're well on your way. Um, and so I, because I love the play process so much, like I feel like of all three of my stages of my process, that play is the most important one. And then the next one is explore. Hang on a sec. I just want to interrupt you here. Sorry, before we go on to number two is um, the idea of play is, you know, it's easy to understand and it's very inspirational. Um, but when artists get to the canvas and they say, okay, today I'm going to play. And then you stand there surrounded by your art materials and your canvas. And I mean, sometimes you just don't know where do you start? So do you, okay. how do you start? Do you just, pick up a random color? Do you, do you pick up a charcoal stick? I mean, what do you do in those first few steps to start your play? And I try to, uh, I try to point out that every artist, their definition of play will be different. So mm. as you know, I am a non-objective artist, which means that I've spent a, a pretty long time in my artist's journey figuring out what play means for me. And mm -hmm. what play means for me might be different for, say, an artist who wants to do something semi-realistic or perhaps they're even like, you know, photorealistic. That, their, their sense of play will be different. But for me, because um, I know that I love marks, I will always start with mark making. And uh, the reason for that is, and I often work large scale. I grab, yes. um, I, my, I've got my favorite dry mark making tools. Um, often it's, uh, you know, it might be a, um, a charcoal stick, it might be a graphic cridy, um, it might be carbon, it might be an oil stick, and I'll uh, work with large movements, but also small, and I'll make things that are really dark versus really light, and things that are really geometric versus things that are curvilinear, and I try to um, push as many extremes as possible. That's my, it, you might call that thought, but it's really not. For me right now, it's more instinct. Like, whatever I see, I, I want to put the opposite. What I see, I want to put the opposite. It's like that. It's like, yes. um, you know, and so, and soft and hard edges, you know, it's all about that. And then once I put the initial dry marks down, I, I do, the one thing I will do before um, the play stage begins is, if it's going to be a painting, I will decide beforehand usually on the palette because I believe in a limited palette, okay. um, you know, for the most part. And I might choose either just one warm and one cool, or I might okay. choose two warms and one cool or two cools and one warm plus black and white. But usually it, if, if there were any more colors than that, it would be because I'm responding to some other challenge. But I feel like after exploring color for so long, I realize that you have a whole world in just, well, you have a whole world in just one color plus black and white. So if you add yes. another, you know, it's almost like, wow, you, you do not need a lot of color to express yourself. Yes, yes. Okay. So then we can go on to step two. What is your second step after play? Yeah. <laughs> so after play, um, you know, usually it's ugly. And I, I, mm. I always say ugly is good. In fact, ugly is a lot harder to get to than I think most people realize. At least it, it can be. I mean, you know, I, I think it all depends on what your, what your definition of ugly is. But let's say that you do achieve ugly. 
it's important, I think, to understand what ugly means. Like, why do you think it's ugly? Is it because you don't have a lot of change in value or is it because you hate the color? You know, ugly then. Um, again, this is all introspection. It's easy to say it's ugly, but it's harder to define why. So in my case, I consider ugly to be, um, number one, the, the design is not there. It's not anywhere close because I've not given it any consideration. All I have is a bunch of everything. There is no organization to it. Um, it's not clear where the eye is going. It's not clear what I care about. Um, it's not clear what my favorite colors, shapes, lines, anything. Nothing is clear. Yes. So explore then is my next stage. And in the stage, I essentially become grown up to be a teenager now. So whereas mm -hmm. like being a three-year-old, I consider explore to be now I'm a teenager. Now teenagers um, by nature uh, are a bit reckless, they take risks, they, you know, they have a lot of courage, I would say, because they're willing to, you know, destroy something, and because they don't like what they see, they're going to try and make yes. it better. Yes. Um, I think that is as close as I can get to thinking of, like, the mindset I try to have in the explore stage. It might mean you have to let go of something you like because it's in the wrong place or it's the wrong color. Um, to, it's the time when you don't fall in love with anything, you're just trying to move your painting forward, this is the stage where a lot of people get stuck because they're still dealing with the ugly from the play stage and they just don't know what to do. For me, it's like a layer and layer. I put, you know, form on top of form, shape on top of shape. Um, I add, I subtract, I try anything. Essentially, I'll just look at the, the gigantic mess I have in front of me. And um, once I, you know, I, I realize that, usually at this point there's nothing is working um you know there there's nothing that i love about what i see in front of me so the idea is to then overlap and add paint subtract paint whatever it takes um add a texture um until i start to see glimmers of hope and i i describe this process as um you're essentially throwing everything you possibly can into a shopping cart until it's just overflowing and you know they're all things you think you might like um but at the end you have to check out and you know you realize you don't have enough money to buy everything and you don't want everything so you toss out everything in your shopping cart and leave like three or four items that you must have what are those must-haves in your painting and those are the things i call my gems in my painting and in the explore stage, the whole process, and this is the lengthiest process of all three, um, because it can be a week, it can be a day, it can be, you know, it can be a, a year. It doesn't, there is no time frame. But once I found those things that I clearly love and they take time to develop, if you're really being honest with yourself and having patience with yourself and not saying, oh, I have to find them today. I think that a lot of people tend to be like, well, I've been working on this painting for six months and I still don't like anything. Well, that can happen. But um, I think that to really find who you are and your personal voice, the fact that you haven't found anything in six months is as valuable as finding something because you realize that you care. Yes. And well, what do you care about? Well, you care about being honest. And if you didn't care, I would be more worried about that. So. I, I'm more interested in not how much time it takes me, but how honest I'm being to myself. Do I really love it? Or am I just trying to cut corners and say, ah, it's okay, I can live with it. Because that's not what we want. I don't want anything I can live with. I want something that I truly love. So once I found those gems, I move on to the clarify stage. So we had play as a three-year-old, then explore as a teenager. Well, now we grow up and we're in the clarify stage, clearly we are adults. Um, hopefully our tool bag is full of the understanding of design and color because if you don't have that, um, that is why a lot of paintings never get finished. They end up under your bed, uh, mm -hmm. closet. <laughs> Some people even throw them away. And yes. I had a seventh grade teacher who I remember clearly that he said, if I ever see anybody's artwork in the trash, you will get an F. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And so now um, I actually still keep that attitude. I don't ever see any reason to throw anything out. Um, each of our attempts at any work of art is a, an attempt to make something meaningful. So to give up on it, to just over the surface and start over, I think that is kind of um, the shortcut. I, I would like to think that any painting wants to be finished, but 
if you and if you understand what powerful design and personal color are, you will and you will be able to finish that painting, and you will also know when it's done. And I I describe the clarify stages as you know it's finesse, it's subtlety, it's not the big things anymore. It's mm -hmm. not the you know like the teenage phase is like um. Uh, bull in a china shop you're making yes. major, major changes but when you get to clarify and uh, the clarify stages um, it's almost microscopic it may not be all that visible to other people but it might be the changing of an edge from hard to soft or from mm -hmm. from hard to lost and found it might yes. be that texture goes smooth or that you know you glaze over a certain portion um, and harmonize it so it's you you need to number one understand you know that why you're doing it and then how to do it it becomes um where you do need to have the most technical as well as knowledge about um what will make your composition strong and yes. clear and you know so that the person looking at your work can um you know artists being the, the form of communication that it is if if you can't clarify what it is you want others to understand, where to enter your painting, what to see, you know, and you move them around, this is what design is. You, you can explain your story, your narrative, even in non-objective work, but you're using all the design tools that we have to help others navigate through your painting clearly. Um, you know, we've all been to the museum where we go past art, like some art catches our attention and others, other pieces do not. Mm -hmm. and, it's the pieces that capture your attention when you really study what they are. Um, that artist has basically baked into their composition plenty of ways to keep your interest, not only to stop there and look at the painting, but to admire every square inch of the painting. That's the yes. difference. Yeah. So those are my three stages. <laughs> okay. And so what do you think is the appeal of abstract art? The way you explain it, it's a it's a deeply personal. Uh, at least your process is deeply personal, and it's a lot about you and your inner world and your inner processes. What makes that so appealing to other people? Because abstract art is fairly popular. Yeah, I mean, are you are you talking about non-objective versus abstract? Because mm -hmm. I consider my well, okay. So abstraction, you know, um, there's a certain comfort level with being able to identify as a viewer something you can hang on to um, and oftentimes when a person looks at abstract work you know there's a reference to reality and yes. that feels yes. comfortable mm -hmm. um, it, it is a bit uncomfortable for many people looking at non-objective art if they've not again looked at a lot of this kind of art and they don't really understand it that that's totally fine and, yes. and you know from my perspective the people that my work appeals to um, obviously, it's not going to be the same audience as a person who is doing abstraction, perhaps, or you know any other type of genre, mm -hmm. um, figures and landscapes and all those things. Th yes. Those can largely fall into the realm of abstraction, but um, the appeal then comes in, again, the clarity of what you're trying to say. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, well, why do people like Mark Rothko? Why yes. do people like Jackson Pollock? Well, that you would have to ask those people mm -hmm. but perhaps just seeing a color glowing in a very large color field is what moves them or you know if um let's see i'm trying to think of some other um just other artists whose work is very uh not objective um you know uh, i just think that sometimes while, while you're thinking of other artists sometimes I think that the way that many people are raised, um, I know I was, and I think many people from our generations were, where things like enjoying a particular color is not really valuable. <laughs> you know, oh, um, children yeah. who go through phases of, I love pink and everything about pink or about blue or about red, it's like, oh yes, you love pink, but look at all the rainbows of colors. You've got to use them all. Or yes, you love pink, it's just a girl thing. You know, things like that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But it's it's not... It, it's sort of it's not valuable to really just love a color for the feeling it gives you that feeling of joy or pleasure or to love a line or a texture or these things are sort of like by the wayside on your way to creating a perfect picture as a child you know sure. and i wonder if a lot of adults carry that with them like they can look at an abstract um or non-objective piece of art and see a color that they really love but 
that's okay. Now we move on to other real art, you know, <laughs> and they sort yeah. of like bypass that feeling that that color gave me joy. You know, why aren't I standing there longer? Right. And I think that that's a really, really good point. Um, and I think that's why um, when I went to grad school, I came in thinking I, because I was self-taught for two decades before I went back to uh, grad school in art mm -hmm. and uh, my first degree was in biochemistry and, you know, I, the, the same old, same old where, you know, your parents don't want you to be an artist. That's, I got it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I did what was the right thing, but it nearly yes. killed. So mm -hmm. I was going <laughs> to ask you about that. So we'll get onto that after this. <laughs> well, okay, great. But so uh, what I think is um, what, what saved me, I think, going to grad school, what I, because the first thing I did was I, I took an art history course and I took the second one. There were two semesters. And yes. those two courses changed everything for me because uh, once you realize that, um, you know, if you go through and you look at all the different um, periods of time throughout history where artists were, you know, if you know about, say, Impressionism or you know about the Renaissance or you know about any other um, time in art history, it's because there was a movement that was rebellious. They were not yes. liking what had been done in the past, or it could have been moved by something happening politically or socioeconomically. Um, there was something causing them to want change. And oftentimes their art was not accepted. It was rejected. It was hated. Um, they, they were up against tremendous odds, but they stuck with what they were doing because they believed in it. And when you look at abstract expressionism, it was the very same thing. They didn't want impressionism anymore. They were tired of it. They didn't, you know, they were um, rebels again. And they, they felt that, no, it doesn't have to be um, so much, you know, because the impressionists largely were abstract artists. They were doing things that were recognizable, figures and landscapes and buildings and all these wonderful things. I mean, not to take away from impressionism, but yes. the abstract impressionists, that's what that whole movement is about. Now, if you don't take art history and you don't understand how brave those artists were, mm -hmm. then um, yes, you're going to uh, perhaps feel like, well, I don't get it. What's yes. the point? Yes. For me, what I think going through art history did for me was even the minimalists, who I had a very hard time appreciating a white square on a white background. I didn't yes. get it until I went through art history and it's like, I get it. I get it. It's so um, it's so not about everything that went before that period of time. And then it, it was like now it represented um, courage to me rather than ridiculousness. Yes. So I do understand why many people may feel that um, perhaps focusing on any one design element would not be enough for them, or it could be that they they want to they want to. Um, believe that it could be enough for them, but they feel like due to um, social pressure that it won't be enough. Yes. And I think that is the big jump. Um, once you start to do things that you you feel are enough for you and you do what you know your heart wants you to do and you don't worry about what anybody else is saying to you, I like to say you're bulletproof. Yes. And nobody can <laughs> do anything. <laughs> yes. because we're all subject to criticism by people who, well, what, what, you know, what do you know about art? Nothing. So I yes. don't care what you say. And even if it's a curator or a critic, an art critic, I don't care. I used to be so vulnerable. I used to be so sensitive. I, I even cared what, you know, the person off the street might say. Mm -hmm. Because I live in a town, I live in, in Montana. When I first moved here uh, 30 years ago, I started to pursue abstraction. And that's amidst cowboys and Indians and TVs yeah. and Buffalo. Yes. <laughs> I did not want to paint those things. And here I was with these really, um, you know, abstract florals. And I mean, people were rolling their eyes. And so, you know, again, I, I get that whole thing. But and I was very vulnerable. But then one thing led to another. And I'm now at the point in my life and my career where I will do what I want to do. Um, I will not be formulaic. I will not do anything twice. Um, I don't care about repeating what I've done before. I want to, I actually want to fail. Yes. <laughs> it sounds like, right. I, maybe yeah. you feel that way too. Um, I get there's it. So much, yeah, there's yeah. far more to learn from failing than yeah. there ever is succeeding. So I don't consider to, I don't want that kind of success. I want the kind of success that if it comes at all, it's from continually trying to fail because that's where the teacher is yes. for myself. 
So since you mentioned that you want to do, you, you don't want to be formulaic and repetitive, um, I did have a question written here for you. What are your thoughts on an artist, you know, oftentimes there's advice out there that you have to find your style and be consistent in your style so that your work is recognizable as yours. And um, sometimes I think style can be a, a little bit boring, whereas versus somebody like you who wants to explore all the time and change and move from, like you say, you move from realism to abstraction to non-objective art. Um, can you just talk a little bit about style, having a style versus exploring and changing? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. And my response to that is that when you're young and you, you know, you're, you're, you're an artist and you're trying new things and maybe you copy somebody's art and then people say, oh no, don't copy. But I'm all for copying, number one. I, I think that that's how we learn. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it because no matter what, you are not the artist you're copying, therefore it cannot be an exact copy. And, you know, I, that, that's the first thing. Um, so yes. the journey for finding your personal voice, for me, what that meant was, and it was really an important question because all those years when I was like trying to find who I was, I also heard that, well, you know, if you want to get into a gallery, you, you have to have a consistent style. And when you're young and you're vulnerable, you're going to comply because you think that that's what that's what the that's what you're expected to do. That's how you gain respect. And some people take that to the nth degree, and their work is so formulaic. Yes, yes in ten galleries, they sell all kinds of work. However, um, I'm not going to question whether they're happy or not. But I can only say that if that were me, I would quit. Mm -hmm. um, I do not think that extent of a personal voice is after discovery anymore. I think that's like found a package that sells, yeah. you're going to reproduce that and, and, and that's okay, that's fine for those artists who want to do that. But yeah. for me, now having a personal voice for me is every bit as important. Um, it's just that there's a difference between finding your personal voice and having it look like you put 10 paintings together and you can never tell one from the other versus yeah. that 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 artist because I recognize perhaps your your personal voice is that you're innovative perhaps your personal voice is that you're you have courage and you're willing to not do the same thing again that can actually be your signature so yes, yes. and also I think for me the way that I because I work in four mediums and what happened was uh, in around in 20 um, 16, um, I had a big museum show coming and it was around 24, 2700 square feet and I work in four mediums and I felt like I don't want to look like 16 personalities. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. I had two years to figure it out. What I figured out was that I can have one personal voice and work in encaustic, encaustic monotype, oils and acrylic for very disparate mediums and look like one person if I do one thing. And that is um, distill down what it is you must have in your personal style. So for me, it was shapes that are very unusual. They're, they're crazy. They're not anything that really make much sense, perhaps. They're completely um, just invented. Like they don't really um, relate to what's happening um, in our real world. So shape is one thing. And then um, I must have color that's complex and you only get it from um, distressing your art and glazing and you know putting on taking it off um, the color must be very uh, sophisticated I guess I don't want color straight out of the tube or and that kind of thing I want it to be like you know very um, manipulated to the point where yeah these colors are really personal now because these do not exist unless I yes. mix them yes. and then the other third thing is mark making I must have mark making so as long as you know the, what the, so say the three things you must have and you do that mm -hmm. again and again any gallery uh, let's just say the galleries that might want my work are going to appreciate that and because there are all kinds of different galleries and and you know let's say clientele who might want to purchase your art but I am not interested in the galleries that don't want that I would only yes. be interested in the galleries that do want that that's the difference so if it means that I, I have fewer people wanting my art. I don't care. I, that that can't be the defining 
reason why you do something. Yes. So yeah, that's how I feel about, you know, your personal voice. Yes, it is important, but it doesn't mean that it has to look repetitive. There are yes. many ways to define a personal voice. Definitely. So since you have four different mediums, what would you say is your favorite art material? If you could only have one, what would it be? And what are your four mediums? Oh, you did mention it, sorry. Yeah, so what would yeah. be your favorite one? I would have to say that, you know, I love paint, but I'm fascinated by marks. And give me a pencil, give me a couple of pencils. If I could have 10 pencils of different, different widths and darknesses, mm -hmm. yes. I would be a very happy person. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and again, yeah, we actually did lose everything in our, uh, in our, when our house burned down in 2016, I actually did lose everything. And I had to really decide, well, what am I going to do? I, I had that museum show coming um, and I had very little time to get materials. Um, mm -hmm. So what happened was I, I didn't do the dry mark making, but I, but what I did do to fill out the rest of that show came down to encaustic on uh paper which is, is close to basically looking like just drawing but it was done with hot wax so it did kind of boil down to well if I can only have one thing mm -hmm. and it completely came down to the mark making okay and the type of paint that you like to use um you know I love all kinds of paint um I think now that I know what I want um I'm more interested in is any medium like I do love oils with cold wax medium. I love it for the many things that it can do that say traditional oils cannot do. Mm -hmm. I love acrylic because, you know, there are many advantages of that medium mm -hmm. that dries quickly and um, you can roll it up and you can ship it. Um, but I also love, you know, encaustic, uh, a little bit more involved. And um, that's kind of um, one of the mediums where it is a little bit more laborious with the technique, but I, what I love about it is the luster of the surface and then encaustic on paper. Again, the reason I love that is because it brings me back to drawing and being able to ship work around, you know, yes. the world that it's very lightweight and easy. Yes. Yes. And what does your studio look like? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, I love my studio right now or any day. I mean, this is my happy place and yes. You know, I used to have in our house um, uh, four different areas of our house, uh, two sides of, well, both sides of the garage, um, one dedicated to every medium I did, and mm. that meant four different places um, in my home. And I was trying to take over the house like a yes. virus. Yes, <laughs> as so, many artists do. <laughs> I know, I, I do hear that a lot. And um, now that I'm renting a space, I uh, really feel like I kind of lucked out because I have about, I think, close to 3,000 square feet. And uh, mm -hmm. due to the fact that I was insured when I lost my studios, um, our insurance company um, did did very well by me. They, they helped me to um, get you know, the best daylight corrected bulbs and I got really nice ventilation put in and uh, track lighting and, and they, they really did um, kind of sort of compensate, I guess, for the losses. And mm -hmm. I have, um, you know, plywood walls that I can drill, I can screw into and hang heavy panels. And then um, it's, it's basically both a gallery and a studio. So I, I do sometimes have open studio tours and then I can also teach here. Yes. I can also take upstairs because it's an old 1939 built building. It's the Rocky Mountain Grange in Hamilton. There's a lot of history here and a lot of space for people. You know, it's meant for the community. Um, though I'm renting downstairs, the upstairs has a full blown uh, stage. And um, so it's, it's just wonderful to be in this community building. And I feel yes. uh, very lucky. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And do you want to tell us about the fire that destroyed your first studio? Yeah, um, so uh, we've lived in Montana for 30 years, and um, prior to the, the fire of 2016, we'd been evacuated twice, and because we've always lived in the woods, and you okay. know, that's something that you, know, you realize when you buy a home or rent a home um, in, in the woods that, you know, yeah, fire's a real reality here in the West, and well, this, this is the third time that, um, in this case, uh, we actually didn't have any warning at all. What happened was um, my sister-in-law was visiting and she was reading a book on a lawn chair in the front yard and she happened to look down the road and she saw a little puff of smoke. And because she grew up in Colorado, she said, you know, it doesn't look right. Something mm -hmm. about it just didn't look right. And she then told my husband who was working on in the garage and he also didn't think it looked right. And then he came inside and I was painting um, 
on really big panels with oil paint and he said, you know, you need to pack up and go. And I said to him, no, I'm not because <laughs> we've been evacuated twice before and those were both false alarms and no, I'm not going to leave. And then about, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes later, I poked my head out the front door and I looked down the road and about, it looked like it might've been about a mile away. I just saw this huge ball of fire coming and it's like, oh my gosh, this is it. Oh so mm. everybody kicked into gear. Um, everybody knew I had this big museum show coming and they, we had some big vehicles, fortunately. Um, we threw all the art, wet panels and all into yeah. the, the various cars we had, our pets, we tried to, our dog, we had two dogs. Um, we got them right away, but our one cat just was nowhere to be found. And um, that was the hardest part because we never did find that one cat and my husband and my son left or they they stayed well behind the time when um the firefighters eventually showed up and they said you know you have to get out now well yes. they they didn't get for another half an hour um wow. and so we ended up um never finding that one cat and then we lost the other cat later because it jumped out of a screened window where we were renting so we never saw that cat again so oh. that was the hardest part was losing our pets and yes. when we, you know, we came back to our house four days later, we didn't really even know what to expect because we didn't even know, nobody would tell us, well, yeah, your house burned down. We didn't, yeah. we weren't even admitted back for about four days. And when we came back, um, there was not anything left. I mean, it, 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 it's hard to even describe it because there are certain things you think can't even burn. Um, yes. Well, the only thing that burn, there are a few pieces of ceramic, but they were broken and, and dirty, but things that you would have thought could have withstood a fire, I guess he realized that no, um, fire will take everything. And um, yeah, so mm, it just, wow. it, um, the hardest part of, I mean, it wasn't losing the things that we lost. I think it was oh. more having to slow down and, and not do the work that you love mm. and be held back by meeting with insurance people and yes, <laughs> having to yes. think of every little thing you lost like nobody wants to do that but you have to if you want yes. to be able to yeah so oh that and, and at a time where you were getting ready for a gallery show that must have been especially devastating <laughs> yeah because um I, I never even ran downstairs where i had another studio and i had like packed away art that was meant for the show and i was just mm. you know kind of throwing it down there so i never even made it downstairs um I made one trip upstairs, looked at my closet, and it's like, I can't, I, I can't, no, nothing. So I grabbed one pair of boots that my mom gave me. That was it. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I, I had my sketchbooks in a, mm. a tote bag, but I set it down for one second to grab something from the encaustic studio. I never picked it up again, so I lost that and lost a lot of panels that all, well, all of my husband's sculptures. He's a, he's a biochemist, but he's also a very good sculptor, and um, nice. that, to me, to this day, is probably the hardest thing of all is knowing that we lost all of his sculptures that some were many were gifts to me and had yes. a lot of meaning and yes. um if i could do anything over again it would be grab the sculptures first that's yeah. what does he what material does he sculpt in um he loves to sculpt in wood and found materials i remember he made sculptures out of like an old satellite dish he's very mm -hmm. innovative creative and yes. uh, yeah just cement um wow well a, a wide variety of things and there was an yeah. oil paint that he had done when he was 18 when he was in nigeria and uh, unbelievable painting and we lost that too so yeah yes. that, that was again the only things we cared about were, were probably things that were were made yes yes so it is quite interesting that both of you you and your husband then started as scientists um, and you mentioned this earlier. <laughs> so you started your, your adult life as a scientist. And now, is your husband still working as a scientist and sculpting is his hobby? Or has he become an artist like you? Yeah, he uh, is the full-time scientist. And okay. uh, we met because we were both pursuing um, biochemistry. I was an undergrad. He was a graduate student. And unlike me, he was destined to be an amazing scientist, whereas my destiny was to never, never go anywhere near a lab. <laughs> and that's okay. I didn't realize that I was pursuing something that, you know, I didn't really love it, but I felt like it was the right thing to do. Yes. Um, and so to this day, uh, you know, he's been a scientist his whole life and uh, he does art whenever he can. He's a wonderful, he draws and he likes mm -hmm. to sculpt and um, uh, he has 
uh, made a lot of sculptures since the fire, but he has very little time. Um, that's, you know, I think you kind of make your choice. And yes. he's a full-time scientist. I'm a full-time artist, but he um, is very, very supportive of everything I've ever done. And it was because of him that I felt the freedom and um, the ability to, I, I really didn't believe in myself, even though I loved art, you know, I loved it, but I, I certainly didn't believe in myself. But, you know, having one person who can encourage you and be supportive and, you know, not be judgmental, um, that was what the difference was because my parents didn't understand really, and that's okay. Um, I'll never blame them for that. I think, you know, I understand you, you, you realize that if you're an artist, usually it will be a very tough um, way to make a living. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, it took me a long time to get where I am. So I don't, uh, I, I can understand a parent's point of view. However, you know, going forward and with our own kids, it was more about, you know, no, what is it that really makes you happy? Because if you do what makes you happy, you will be fine. <clears throat> that's, that's what I, that's what I truly believe. Yeah. Yes. And are your kids artists or have they, or scientists? I'd say they're, um, they're both extremely creative. Um, the, my older son, Kalen, um, what he did was he went out and he created his own company and he's an entrepreneur and uh, our other son who's younger by three years, um, they work side by side, they work together. And um, the younger one is also very creative and um, he does a lot of graphic design for the company. So okay. I would just say that um, really anything you can think of, there's there's so much creativity to make it work. Mm, and especially in the entrepreneurial realm. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> yes. It's been quite amazing to see all that they've gone through, all that they've endured, all that they've persevered. Um, it's It's been tremendous. I mean, being parents and not only seeing your kids become entrepreneurs and stick with it, but then also to be like so close together. Yes. Um, I It's like a dream for us. Um, yes. I think that that's, yeah, that it's very, something we just as parents are so proud of them and and couldn't be happier yes so what inspires you <clears throat> um well to be honest what inspires me i think is obviously the art making process is full of challenge it's a journey it's um it's not easy art will never be easy but mm. i think what really um is very important to me as well at this point in my life, I feel lucky to have had the education I've had. I mean, I was I was self-taught for many years, and then I got the education that I feel many artists will probably never get for for many reasons. I mean, there yes. you know, life is what it is. With this information, um, what inspires me is to try and help as many artists as I possibly can to not go through what I did, because um, it wasn't just getting off. You know, starting with the wrong career that literally almost, you know, did me in. It's it's all the other things that happen along when you do decide that you want to pursue your art. Um, it's a very very um, difficult journey to navigate on your own, and there's a lot of information out there that I think is not really helping artists. And I think the kind of information you know to succeed that you need to know to succeed is is not that much really and that's yes. kind of what i believe and i could pack it you know like again I, I this online course that i created it's only about 11 hours long mm -hmm. but it has a lifetime of information that i just seriously believe that if anybody really wants to um dramatically cut down the learning curve of being a professional artist you must have a full toolbox. And so I, what inspires me is when I can help even one artist, like get it and yes, yes. be able to all of a sudden not have that procrastination, not have <clears throat> understand why they need to play and understand like there's a time to think, but there's a time not to think. And yes. there's a, there is a definite way to know if your painting is finished. It's not an unknown. There actually is a way to know. So that's what I'm really excited about is Yes, I love to paint, but I also want others to, to have that joy that took me so long to find. Yes. Like, I did not have joy in making art. I, I, I dreaded it. I used to not even go into my studio until 10 at night, and I'd work till 3 because I had so much fear. And I just, you know, I, if I can 
you know, help a few artists to not have that kind of fear, then to me, that's what inspires me. <laughs> Do you have one tip for the listeners <clears throat> specifically on how to overcome that fear of making art? Yeah, it really is comes down to being to understanding what play is all about and to each artist needs to find what play means for them and then to spend a long, long time just doing that without any expectations, without any shows that are looming in the future. Um, just really um, be able to get your mind back into that time when you were three, because that was probably the last time you were really happy making art. Yes. Uh, it's very hard. And, you know, again, for every artist, it'll be different. But I think from what I've seen, when artists can do that, they, um, it, it just opens up a whole new um, sort of, I don't know, box of joy, I guess, that yes. they can open at any time and, and always come back to that. Like, even if they have a bad day, it's like, well, I'm just going to put some marks on a sheet of paper and call that, you know, but that's better than not doing anything. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. And play, play is often confused with just a waste of time, messing around and, you know, not being serious about your art. <laughs> yeah, but actually, um, it, you know, as adults, I think that if we don't, there, there's something about um, just getting started, just yes. doing one thing. And if that one thing happens to be a mark on a sheet of paper, and it's the question, you know, we don't want to become blocked as an artist. If we want to be a professional artist, the last thing we want to ever do is get bored or get yes. stuck. And if it means just putting a mark on a sheet of paper and rubbing it around, um, you've done something that's better yes. than nothing. Yes. And to give yourself credit for that, because look at how many jobs are out there that are more of a nine to five job and look at how many unhappy people there are in those jobs. Um, not everything you do is going to be a masterpiece, but being serious and being devoted to your art means that you do whatever you have to do to keep moving the ball forward and to yes. not ever give up. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's, that's what I, that's why I think the play stage is, is crucial. <laughs> so in your course, um, you say that you package everything that you believe an artist needs to know to be successful. So. Does that in, does that mean the <clears throat> excuse me the the technical you know like color value composition those sort of things or do you also include um, how to earn a living from your art? Yeah, no. Um, the this course that I have right now is called Powerful Design and Personal Color, and I launched it about less than a year ago. Now it was launched in November of 2018, and uh, I knew nothing about you know recording myself or editing a video, um, sound quality, all these things. I mean, yes. but I think I just knew that it had to be done. I, I, I didn't know what I was, uh, how long it would take me or anything. But so the course, this course focuses on clearly filling the artist's toolbox with what I consider to be the visual tools that allow you to understand the visual language, the visual yes. language of art is not, you know, there aren't, it's not like we have 26 letters in the alphabet. We only have seven design elements and we only have a, a handful of principles. And it's not like you're, you're unfamiliar with the word color or the word, you know, the word texture. However, what most people never get in art school or being self-taught or maybe they buy books or they go to workshops, we get a lot of technical information, but what we don't get is you know, probably the most important thing is, well, what do you do with all these things once they're on your paper or your canvas yes. or your board? So my okay. course is meant to definitely emphasize the only emphasis. It's not really on technique at all. What it is, is it's an emphasis on the design elements, on composition, on color, on mixing, on harmonizing. And once you have that in your toolbox and once you can, um, you know, go through this and understand, you know, who you are as a person, what, what are the things you must have in your art? To be honest with you, yeah, there's going to be another course, and that will be more about the professional side of how do you take your art and now make a full-time income from that. Yes. But until you grasp this course, the other course doesn't matter. Don't even go there. You, you, need, you need to be creating the best art you possibly can. Really believe in yourself. 
And I think that's a big mistake I see with, you know, young artists or people who might have a great painting. It's kind of like, you know, a lot of times um, it's hit or miss. When, yes. when you don't really understand design or color, yeah, you might get a great painting and get really excited and be so proud of it and walk right into a gallery and say, this is me, will you carry me? And they say, yes. But then, because you don't understand how you did it or can't repeat it, not, I don't mean the same painting, but I mean even the things that made it great. Yes. You are going to have, you're going to go into depression and be like, why can't I do it again? Well, it's because you don't have a full toolbox. And so again, um, it, it comes down to basics. Um, it's the kind of information that every artist must have, I believe, in order to be consistently productive and happy and, you know, full of joy. Um, so, yeah, I think that they have to kind of go through this first and do a lot of like, do the their exercises and there's homework and, and there's, um, you know, you're going to create 16 paintings in four different palettes of their limited palettes. And mm -hmm. it, it, it really kind of simplifies the color down into a way that you can understand it and, and build then on that information and go way beyond the course to then explore way more color combinations. But it starts with simplicity, actually. Yes. It's not meant to be hard. It's just meant to be um, information that, again, um, hard press to find it. I, I don't know why it's so hard to find. Yes, <laughs> to find it in a concise form. Yeah. One last question, Pam, before we have to end it is, can you tell us a day in your life, what it's like, from when you wake up to when you go to bed? What does your day look like? Yeah, it's interesting you asked that because I, I just was thinking about doing a video on a day in the life because <laughs> my days are, are I, I uh, okay, to start out with, um, I'm usually not getting up terribly early because I've, I've been up till two in the morning the night before or three, but let's say I get up at, I, I set my alarm for 7.30 and um, I'm probably up and about by eight. Um, usually have to have a cup of coffee and then um, I, I will head to my computer and just let, can take care of any like big fires that need to be put out. Um, yes. Then I'll grab the puppies and take them to my studio, which is about oh, a mile and a half away and uh, turn the lights on, turn the heat on because it's, it's really cold. Even when it's 100 degrees outside, um, that's Fahrenheit, but it'll be like 55 downstairs because I'm below ground level and okay. um, turn all the lights on, get my computer hooked up. Um, decide whether I'm doing a video, decide whether I'm starting a painting, decide whether I'm continuing a painting, or decide whether I'm finishing a painting. And then if I have, um, you know, I, I've got a membership group where I critique others' work. Sometimes I'll be critiquing work or preparing for the call. Um, or I will be packing a suitcase like I'm headed for Mexico to teach uh, on Wednesday. So today, um, there won't be any real painting done because I have to pack and uh, make sure my suitcase doesn't go over 50 pounds. And I have to make sure I've got all my demos and, um, you know, the every everything. I've got a checklist. In fact, I was yes. before I, talking with you. It's a three-page long checklist to make sure I don't forget anything. Yeah. And um, so then um, on days when I am painting, I, I really do believe in documenting everything I do because um, I originally started doing that because it kind of is a – one of those things where my mother was very creative and I think she was a, a phenomenal artist, but she is Japanese and, and she was never, I think never believed in herself. Okay. And I, I just remember seeing one of her sketchbooks because she was a fashion designer and, and a pattern designer. She went through um, design school in Japan and came here as a very, you know, in her twenties. And um, I saw her sketchbook one time when I was probably in my teens and I thought, wow, mom, you can really draw. But somehow that sketchbook got lost or whatever, thrown away. Probably my dad threw it away oh. um, <laughs> for my whole life until the day she died. I would have loved to have had anything that she would have created for me or just something she created that I could have. And, you know, I had like clothing that she made, but nothing she'd ever drawn she went to a church where she painted these rocks for kids. And I was like, mom, can you just send me a rock that you painted? And I <laughs> never got one. And I think when I am gone from this earth, I want my boys to have something of me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it's, they're so busy with their lives. Um, they're entrepreneurs. They, they work so hard. They work, you know, 80 hour weeks. And when I'm gone, I want to leave behind documentation of, everything as much as I can give them as I possibly can so my artwork yes but 
you know, I'm talking in my videos and explaining my process. And I'm hoping that someday if I have grandchildren, they'll be like, oh, that's who grandma was. You know, we don't know her, but that's my motivation. I think really personally, um, it's a deep down feeling like I don't want to leave this world without being able to give something to my kids that yes. will remember me with something more than just one artwork or something. I mean, it's, mm. I think uh, a painting for me is like reliving your life. The whole reason why I equate it to these stages of play, explore and clarify is because they mimic your life and every painting can grow up from being a child to an adult. And it it's an opportunity to put who you are into every painting so that it can live forever and represent who you are all, all of your life, not just as an adult, but as a child as well, that, that those underlying layers are the childlike portion of who you are. Mm. And um, yeah, so um, I don't even remember what your question was. but <laughs> It doesn't matter because what you're saying is, is wonderful anyway. And I, I, I do think that that is what puts a lot of people off the more abstract non-objective style of art is the fact that it does bring you face to face with yourself and yeah. as the artist you have to face that and express that and look at it for you know all its ugliness and all its beauty and as the viewer i think it sometimes touches aspects in ourselves that we recognize and somebody else has put it in front of us as a little mirror um perhaps even subconsciously but i think that often accounts for that feeling of, oh, I don't like that, or, oh, I like that, but I don't know why, you know? Yeah, yeah, and I, I do believe that, you know, whether you don't like it or you do like it, um, both both are so valid as far as, like, helping you find who you are, because whether you, if you don't like it, why? And if you do like it, why? And both of the answers will give you more information about who you are and what you're after. And I... Um, yeah, I think art making for me is just asking myself a lot of questions that are usually yes or no answers. So um, it's really not that hard, but yes. but again, I, I think that we need to have our toolbox full before we can really fully answer those questions. Definitely. Thank you, Pamela. So in closing, do you have um, one or two tips for artists out there, just sort of like words of wisdom? that you could, I mean, you've given us so much, but if you could summarize it, uh, what would that be? Just one or two things of value for them to take I'd away. Say, yeah, I'd say the first thing, um, and this is because I do it myself and I know how important it was, um, is to essentially try to fail. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> failures and, and embrace ugly because um, once you can do that, and be comfortable with it. And it's very hard. A lot of people are, um, you know, they're they're aghast. They'll look at their work and, and they're ready to quit. Um, but if you can actually be okay with that, um, that's really just the beginning. And I literally, once you can embrace ugly, it'll never be hard for you to begin a painting again. Um, and I guess the flip side of that is, um, you know, the only success that matters is that you're being true and honest to yourself. It's never about pleasing another person, especially when it comes to art. Um, it's not about pleasing a gallery and making them happy so they can make lots of sales. I mean, you might be making some money, but you may, as an artist, may not be that happy yourself. And I think being a, an artist and being a happy one that can sustain your practice for, for as long as you live. Yes practice that you never want to retire from completely relies on being honest with yourself. And, and if it means you have to, um, yeah, it's fine to be inspired by other people, but, and it's fine to copy other people and all those things, because I like to think of copying is you'll copy and then you'll adapt it to be yours. Mm -hmm. So don't let anything stop you. But at the same time, success should be measured by, how happy you are deep down um, and, you know, making sure that you're absolutely maximizing your ability to push your own creativity in this lifetime. Because for me, a formula is definitely not exploiting all who you are. No. And uh, I don't think that creating by a formula, um, I think you can, I think every artist can do more than that. So I would encourage them to do that. <laughs> yes, it's like that comfort zone thing. We have to keep moving past the comfort zone. 
Yes, absolutely. Keep pushing. The, uh, make sure you're not comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's the one thing we don't like is to be, you know, uncomfortable, but that's probably the place where, you, where the most magic happens is in discomfort. Yeah, I love that you said that because uh, mm -hmm. I, I actually really encourage people to not be comfortable. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Pam. We have to end it there, unfortunately. Um, I could talk to you for another hour, but thank you for your time. Yeah. I know you're very busy. Um, before we go, please just tell the listeners where they can find you online. This will also be in the show notes, though. Right. Okay. So I have a website. I have two websites. One is my personal one. It's PamelaCoey.com. And it's terribly out of date because I've been focusing more in the last year on uh, my, my training, my teaching training mm. instruction, which is artandsuccess.com. And the name of my online course is Powerful Design and Personal Color, which is good for any 2D medium and any level, whether you're a beginner, intermediate or advanced artist. Okay. That will be in the show notes for everyone to go and have a look. Thank you so much. And um, I hope to catch up with you again maybe in a year or two and see where you are. Angie, thank you so much for your time and for reaching out to me. I really appreciate it. And you're in New Zealand, is that right? Yes, I am. And I'm going to be teaching there hopefully three workshops next year. So I would be more than happy to love to keep up with you. That would be oh, wonderful. Yes. Thank yes. you so much. Okay. Thank you, Pam. Bye. Yeah, bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Not Starving Artist. Remember to visit AngieNoll.com for show notes and links to today's guest. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and join us again next week where we talk to another Not Starving Artist.